Hello all, welcome to this tutorial. Ever wondered how to treat patients with both ESR1 and pic 3 ca mutant metastatic breast cancer or choose treatment beyond second line? I'm Dr. Aditya Bardia, breast medical oncologist at UCLA, and I'm thrilled to be hosting this 10-day tutorial right here on the Breast Cancer Connect page. Today, we'll delve straight into the patient case of Amber. Amber is a 68-year-old postmenopausal female diagnosed with ER-positive HER2-low metastatic breast cancer with bone metastases in 2021. Her first-line treatment involved a combination of anastrozole and abemacyclib. Two and a half years after treatment initiation, routine scans revealed worsening bone metastases and a new lesion in the liver. IHC report confirmed ER-positive HER2-low status, showing 82% staining for ER and HER2 score 1+. Now that Amber has disease progression on a CDK4-6 inhibitor, which biomarkers should we test to inform second-line treatment selection? ESR1 mutation, PIK3C mutation, BRCA and germline PALB2 mutation, all of the above. I would have answered the same. This would be my preferred option as well. To best inform second-line treatment selection, it becomes crucial to test for potential biomarkers because they are actionable and could help select targeted therapies to complement endocrine backbones in this setting. Current guidelines do recommend testing for ESR1 mutations upon disease progression. ESR1 mutations have a prevalence of approximately 40% after treatment with AIs for patients with ER-positive her to negative metastatic breast cancer. Besides ESR1, testing for PIK3CA mutation is also relevant because they can contribute to resistance to endocrine therapy and occur in about 30 to 40% of hormone receptor positive breast cancer cases. Current guidelines also recommend testing for germline BRCA mutation with the option of adding PALB2. So testing for all of the above, when possible, could better inform treatment choices in the second line setting. Targeted therapies have been developed to address all these mutations with optimal results. But the challenge is when two of them occur at the same time. This is precisely what we'll address in the next question. Genomic tests detected both PIK3CA and ESR1 mutations. Which second-line therapy would you choose for Amber, who has metastatic ER-positive breast cancer? Elacestrant, alpelacid plus fulvestrant, capecitabine, or fulvestrant monotherapy? It's interesting to see the discordance in the response. Let's explore this further. So currently addressing both ESR1 and PIK3C mutation presents a challenge as there are no official guidelines for such a case. For patients with ESR1 mutant metastatic breast cancer, elacestrin is a treatment option supported by Emerald and recent FDA approval. How about dual mutations? Interestingly, a recent sub-analysis presented at San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium 2023 demonstrated improvement in progression-free survival with elacestrin was a standard of care regardless of PIK3C mutation or her to low status in patients who had received CDK4-6 inhibitor for at least 12 months. So elacestrin is a potential option for patients like Amber. Alpelacib plus fulvestrin supported by the SOLAR1 trial is an approved option for PIK3C mutant metastatic breast cancer. However, there are no phase three trials comparing its effectiveness versus elacestrin in patients with dual ESR1 mutant and PIK3C mutant metastatic breast cancer. Fulvestrin is a less preferred option given that it's inferior to elacestrin in the setting of ESR1 mutation and inferior to fulvestrin plus alpelacib in the setting of PIK3C mutation. And in the absence of visceral crisis or short PFS to first-line therapy, in general, we would optimize endocrine-based therapy over chemotherapy, which could be used in later lines. 
So if we opt for elastestrant in Amber's treatment, the next question is, how do we navigate potential treatment-related side effects? After one month of elastestrant, Amber reports grade two nausea during routine clinical visit. What would you do? Reduce dose, hold drug until the nausea resolves to grade one or baseline, and then reduce dose. Hold drug till nausea resolves to grade one or baseline, then resume at the same dose or permanently discontinue drug. Thank you. It's interesting to see your response. For management of doses and adverse events, if we look at the EMA recommendations, for patients with grade 2 AEs, interruption is recommended till the AE resolves to baseline or grade 1. Then it can be resumed at the same dose level. For grade 3 or higher AEs, interrupt the dose until the AE recovers to grade 1 or baseline, and then reduce the dose. If a patient has a second recurrence of grade 3 AE, the decision to restart elastestrant should be at the discretion of the treating physician based on treatment benefits. However, if the grade 3 AE occurs for the third time, then elastestrant should be permanently discontinued. If you have grade 4 AE, again, elastestrant should be permanently discontinued. So in Amber's case, the patient experienced grade 2 AE, so the recommendation would be stop elastestrant, allow the AE to recover, and then you can start elastestrant again. Also emphasize the importance of taking it with food to alleviate the symptoms of nausea. So following this approach, Amber had no further grade 2 AEs and was able to continue elastestrant. In the next question, we'll discuss how to manage treatment-related AEs if Amber had taken alpelisib plus full western instead. So alternate scenario, after two weeks of alpelisib and full vestrant, reports show signs of hyperglycemia with blood sugar of 220. What would you do? No dosage adjustment, hold drug until grade one or baseline, then reduce dose, Hold alpelisib till grade one or baseline, then resume at the same dose or permanently discontinue alpelisib. Thank you for your response. I would have answered differently. Let's go over this now. In this case, Amber's hyperglycemia would classify as grade two since the fasting blood sugar falls between 160 to 250. For grade 2 AEs, dose adjustment with alpelisib is not required in this case. Instead, anti-diabetic treatment such as metformin or SGL2 inhibitors or insulin sensitizers could be initiated or intensified. However, if the blood sugar does not decrease to 160 or less within 21 days under appropriate anti-diabetic treatment, then dose reduction by one dose level is recommended. Keep in mind, if dose reduction is less than 200 milligram of alpelisib, alpelisib should be permanently discontinued because less than 200 milligram, the activity of alpelisib is much less. So other than AEs, what if patients like Amber experience disease progression beyond second line or third line? After nine months of second-line treatment, Amber has disease progression and switches to oral capecitabine. After six more months, she experiences another disease progression. So what fourth-line treatment would you now recommend for Amber, who is metastatic, hormone receptor positive, her to low breast cancer? Trastuzumab emtansine, trastuzumab deroxetan, sasituzumab govitecan, or iribulin. Thank you for participating in the poll. Great to see your response. So overall, in recent times, antibody drug conjugates have gained significant attention and represent a promising approach for patients with ER positive HER2 negative, which includes IHC0 as well as HER2 low metastatic breast cancer who have disease progression beyond second line. In this setting, sasituzumab govitecan and trastuzumab deroxetan emerge as potential options. For patients with HER2 low status, 
in general, trastuzumab deroxetan is preferred given the impressive results from Destiny Bresto 4 trial. For patients with HER2 IHC zero, sasituzumab govitecan could be considered given the benefit in overall survival seen from Tropics O2. Given that Amber had HER2 low disease with HER2 IHC score of one and had undergone one line of chemotherapy with capecitabine, trastuzumab deroxetan would potentially be the best option for her. So in conclusion, I hope you found this tutorial helpful. Here are some clinical takeaways. Elacestrant improved progression-free survival was a standard of care in patients with ESR1 mutant metastatic ear-positive breast cancer, regardless of PIK3CA mutation or HER2 low status in patients who were on CDK4-6 inhibitor for at least 12 months. Hyperglycemia is an on-target side effect of p kinase inhibitor and needs to be monitored and managed closely. TDXT generally is the treatment option for patients with HER2 low metastatic breast cancer. Thank you for joining this tutorial.